then our lecture. This is again picking up where the last lecture uh, left off. Um, one of the emphasis, one of the things that I uh, work very hard on with all of my students and uh, anyone I talk to about mathematics is to help them understand that math doesn't happen just in here. Math, in fact, we don't even study math in here just for the sake of studying math. Otherwise, why do it? Why waste our time? What we do, though, is look at things that we observe out in the world, and then we bring them in here and we try to make sense of them. Um, the best way to, uh, to think about math is that every time you eat, breathe, sleep, touch, feel, observe, see, in, interact with anything, you're taking in some data. And when we have that data, that's what we put in a spreadsheet. But the data doesn't always tell us everything we need to see uh, or understand about that. And so what we want to do is see the data. And that's what we call then the scatter plot. Does the data happen to have a, a shape that goes in a straight line up? Or does it happen to have a upside down parabola shape? You know, what's the, what does the data look like? Once we see what the data looks like, the other reason why we want to do that is because um, I can tell you by looking at the data what happened from last week to today. But I can't tell you what it's going to look like next week. I can only guess, I can only hope that I can estimate what will happen next week. And I estimate by saying if the data is in a straight line going up and it continues in that pattern, I can pretty much tell you about what it's going to look like next week. If it's in an upside down parabola shape, I can kind of tell you what it's going to look like next week. But I don't have the data to actually look at it. So mathematics actually comes from our existence in life. And all throughout the semester, this is business calculus. And I'm going to try my best to help you see where you use this mathematics in all of your life, especially in your business major. One of the things that we, uh, that we work with is um, taking a couple of functions and trying to um, merge them in some way. Maybe add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them. Uh, one thing that I, I made a point of in the lecture, beginning lecture, is to help you think about what we have when we look at our notation. Mathematics by itself is not really that difficult. We make it difficult by using some symbols and notation that aren't familiar to us. And so when we look at f of x, the, in, the information we have inside the parentheses, everything we have inside the parentheses is the input value or expression. Everything we have, though, f of x, when we put that notation in here, this now is our output expression. So if I want to know what's the output, the output is f of x. Now, the equal sign. Simple. So simple. We sometimes make it too simple. We don't understand, or too complicated. We don't understand how simple it is. When we have the equal sign, what does that tell us? Make it simple. Yeah, what's on one side has the exact same value, name, whatever, as on the other side. So when I look at this, what is another name for this expression? This whole thing. It's an output. Yeah, it's the same thing. It is, again, you know, we can say f of x is the output, but we can also say that is that whole expression is an output. Now, the output expression has the input variable in there, but we call this then the output as well. The input variable is x. Now, we've got two functions, f of x and g of x, and we're saying we're going to add them. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to subtract them? Where do you do this in real life? Well, you guys are business majors, right? We've established that. We have three functions that we talk about in here a lot. Profit, revenue, and cost. How do you compute, how do you compute profit from revenue and cost? 
revenue minus cost. Revenue is a function. It uh, has some numbers and it has some letters and it, uh, it's a function that tells me that if I sell so many units, I have this much revenue coming in. Cost, same thing. It has a, a variable, it has a letter, it has a, a name, an input of how many units and then some numbers associated that say if I make this many units, it's going to cost me this much money. So when we find profit, we're doing exactly the same thing as what we have on this, this slide, and that is we're taking two functions and combining them in some way to create a third function, a new function called profit. So if I were to look at these in the same manner, I would say, well, in this case, now let's back up here. When I look at f of x, what am I talking about, input or output? Output, okay, so the output of function f is going to be added to the output. Now, I'm going to keep putting these words in front of us, but what you need to do is do the same thing. When you are doing your homework, don't just say f of x or f parenthesis x. That has no meaning to it. Put meaning to it. It's the output. It's the output value of function f. So the output value of function f is the same thing as x plus x, or x divided by x plus 1. And the, um, to that, I am going to add the output of function g. And again, the output, the equal sign says what's on one side has the same value, name, meaning as what's on the other side. Uh, when we subtract them, we would have, in this case, um, g of x, so I put x cubed minus x divided by x plus 1. Now we probably would want to go through the arithmetic of finding the common denominator and so forth, and so I trust that you know how to find a common denominator. If not, it's all back in chapter 0. Somewhere in there you're going to be doing some of that. Um, we can multiply them, but when we get to dividing, we have to be a little careful. When we divide, this is saying we're going to take the function f of x and we're going to divide that by x cubed. Now that's okay to do, but we've got to be careful about something. What is that? What is it we have to be really aware of when we do a division? True. True, but we have to be really aware that there's some there's a caution here. There's a caution. I can do this, but okay, I can't divide by zero. Why can't you divide by zero? Have you ever thought about that? You were told, weren't you, you can't divide by zero? Did Mr. Ms. Mrs. So-and-so say you can't divide by zero, your high school? Do you know why? Why can't I divide by zero? Well, let's try something. I'm going to put six items in here, six little dots. And I would like you to tell me how many groups of two dots I have. Easy problem, right? We all know the answer. But tell me now, what is the division problem we just did? Six divided by what? Two. Okay. Because I had six dots, I grouped them in groups of two. How many groups do I have? I have three groups. Okay. Let's try this again. I have no dots in there. I want you to tell me how many groups of two dots I have. What's the division problem? Zero divided by two. How many groups? Zero. Okay, let's do this again. I have six dots. I want you to to show me or tell me how many groups of nothingness I have. How 
How many groups? <laughs> yeah, can you put a number to that? Can you give me a, a symbol that represents the exact number I have? Well, infinity is a symbol uh, that represents a destination I can never get to. Okay, it's not a numerical value. It's really a destination. Now, what is the uh, mathematical, what's a, what's a division problem I've got? 60 divided by 0, yeah. And there is no numeral that represents how many groups. It's undefined. And the reason it's undefined is because it's going to infinity. Okay? So, why can't we divide by 0? Because it keeps going higher. There's, there's no limit. Okay? Uh, there's infinitely many groupings we could have and so forth. Okay, so um, that's one thing we do. We're building new functions out of existing ones by doing some arithmetic operations on them. Uh, there's another way we, uh, we create new, new uh, functions out of old ones or existing ones, and that's by what we call the composition of functions. Um, I know you've studied composition. I know you've had it in a class, let's put it that way, uh, composition of functions. But if I were to ask you, where in the last seven hours have you successfully used a composite function, you probably, a lot of people tell me, oh, I never used x's and y's and f's and f of x's and so forth. You know, it doesn't make any sense to do that. I haven't done that. Well, yes, you have. Now, if you listen to my first lecture, you know that we talk about a function, and I gave you the illustration that even in an English class, we have functions. We don't have x's and y's and numbers necessarily, but we have a grouping of books, titles of books, and we have a grouping of uh, primary authors, and when we match up the author with the book, we have created a function. So the same thing happens here. We can, we can have, we experience composite functions a lot in our lives, but not necessarily in the numerical sense. So let's talk about what a composite function is. Um, if I have, let's say, um, f of x is equal to um, x squared uh, plus 7, and I have um, g of x, and that may be, oh, let's say, the square root of x, now keep in mind, we're talking about input and output, right? f of x is the output of function f. But if I say g of, what do I describe? What is all of this that goes in here, an input or an output? It's an input. I can put anything I want in there. I could even put in f of x. So I'm putting in the output of the function f, but it becomes the input. Now, another way of saying that would be g of, well, what's another way of writing f of x? Another way of writing that output, x squared plus 7. Again, this whole quantity is an input when it's placed as it is in function g. So now what I would have is everywhere I see the input variable of function g, I'm going to replace it with the expression that I have here. Okay, so I have the square root of, and it's going to be the square root of x squared plus 7. Where in the past seven hours did you successfully use a composite function? Well, let's break this down a little bit more. I have a function f. The input of function f is x. The output is the result of squaring x and adding 7. So when I accomplish the first act, the first step, then the result of the first step becomes the beginning point of the second step. You getting it now? 
I look around the room, every one of you successfully used the composite function today. Because I don't see any shoes over your, I'm sorry, I don't see any socks over your shoes. Okay, so the first function was putting socks on. So you start with getting a pair of socks, and the result is you have socks on your feet. Second function is putting shoes on. Where do you start? The socks on the feet. Okay, the result of the last step becomes the beginning point of the second step. So a composite function is not, nothing more than that. We just we, we have one act, and then we have to begin on the second one. Okay, so um, if we do do this problem, you know, f of x is x divided by x plus 1, g of x is x cubed, looking at h of x, in this function, f, what is g of x? And let, we have to make it clear, it's the input of function f. It happens to be the output of function g. So I could say then that h of x is f of x cubed, which means that everywhere I have the input variable of function f, I'm going to now put in x cubed. So I would have x cubed divided by x cubed plus 1. OK. Composite function, a two-part function. And many times what we have to do is we have to first do the first function, the inside function. Once we have that, then we can work on the outside function. We can't do the outside before we do the inside. Okay. And let's go to this one. we got to get through at least part of this. Now, if I'm going to look at uh, g of x is 1 divided by x, by the way, this is what I mean. You really don't need to take down all these words, okay? Online, on Blackboard, all the notes are there. And if you brought those notes in, you don't have to write this stuff down. I want you thinking. Your brain is much more important to me thinking than just writing stuff down. So on uh, Tuesday, please just bring in those notes. And I think what I'll do is I'll go back and, and try to remember to only put them as two slides a page. Then you have room to fill in some detail, and that will help you out too. So if you didn't bring those uh, notes in, please do that. Uh, G of 1 fourth, you know, every place I see the input variable, I'm going to put the value 1 fourth. And just a little reminder, how do you divide by a fraction? You know, mine is not to reason why, just invert and multiply. Okay, so our answer here would be 4, and we could do that. Uh, G of x plus 4, our input expression is x plus 4, so that means we're going to say 1 divided by x plus 4. Now, the second one here, or part C, is where it begins to look a little bit complicated, but let's just be careful. Let's just kind of take it a step at a time. What is this piece right here, input or output? It's an input again. So that means that everywhere I see an input variable in my function, I'm going to put x plus delta x. And then from that, I'm going to subtract g of x, so I would have subtract 1 divided by x. Again, we probably would want to do something with a common denominator and so forth, but I want to finish up today talking about something called the difference quotient. The difference quotient goes like this. It is g of x plus delta x minus g of x divided by delta x. Now, that can look a little bit complicated, but trust me, you studied this in Algebra 1. In fact, everything you need to know for this course, you probably had in Algebra 1. 
that may look a little complicated, but let me break it down for you. Suppose you had the point 2, 5, and you had the point 7, 13. What does delta x stand for? Change of x. So the change in x here is 7 minus 2 or 5. What if I told you that, um, that x is equal to 2? What is x plus delta x then? Two plus seven, two plus five, or seven? Okay. Whoops. Let's put that in there. Seven. Um, so, what is g of x plus delta x? Oh, that'd be g of seven. Okay. So that'd be g of seven or thirteen. What's g of uh, x? Yeah, we said that was x was 2, so that is 5. Let's break this apart. g of x plus delta x. You see, that's 13. g of x is 5 divided by delta x. That is 7 minus 2. That's another name for difference quotient. Slope of a line, that's all it is. Slope of a line. Okay? So we can do that. So our problem up here would be 1 divided by x plus delta x minus 1 divided by x divided by delta x. And again, what we would want to do, because this is just an example here, what we'd want to do is find a common denominator and do a little more arithmetic on it, but uh, it's basically just slope. We have about 30 seconds left here, and another class has to get in real fast, so we'll have to always get out of here right away. Um, to finish this up, what I want you to do, if you've borrowed mine, you're going to come by and you're going to... Um,